Warm welcome to those who are just joining us. Um, we are starting in just a few moments. We're just going to allow some time for people to sign in. You'll see all of our speakers on screen at the moment. Um, please do, uh, please make use of the <coughs> chat box um, while, we're, while we're waiting for people to start. Please let us know who you are, what you do and where you're joining us from. It's always lovely to know who our audience are. Um, we'll give it a moment and then I will just read out some, ha some housekeeping. Um, but please do use the chat box to, to get started while we start. Thank you. Lots of people signing in. There you go. So we'll get started now. So my name is Neil hudson Basing. I'm the Corporate Events Manager at London South Bank University. I'm delighted to be working on this event um, with my colleagues on screen. Um, before we start, I just have a short webinar statement that I'd like to read you. Um, everyone speaking at or attending an LSVU event, whether in person or virtually, should be treated with respect, dignity and courtesy. LSVU operates an environment built on equality, inclusion and acceptance. We value contributions, feedback and comments and wish to create a space for sharing, learning, celebrating and bringing communities together. LSVU does not tolerate any form of bullying, abuse, harassment or discrimination, inappropriate behaviour, including that that potentially impacts or contradicts LSVU's reputation and values, will be treated seriously and acted upon. Anyone exhibiting any example of this behaviour will also be removed from the webinar. We want our events to be an enjoyable and warm experience for all. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. And um, just to take you through the, a bit of housekeeping, um, and for those of you that are not familiar with Zoom, um, you'll see three functions below you. The first is the chat box, um, and we encourage you to make use of the chat box throughout the event. Um, use it to share your thoughts, comments, and um, networking, and help us break down that virtual wall that we're all experiencing at the moment. Um, the next button along is the Q&A button, and we'd like you to encourage you to distinguish between that and the chat box, just so that we don't lose your, lose your um, questions in the chat box. The button along from that is the raise your hand function, and we won't be using that during this session, but obviously during part two, there will be a chance to kind of engage directly with our speakers. I have enabled closed captioning as well. Um, you can click on the arrow next to the closed captioning function, the CC, just along from the chat box, and you can either hide the subtitles or you can enlarge them should you wish to. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Calvin Morley. Great, thank you, Neil, and um, thank you everyone. Good afternoon. Um, welcome, thank you for joining us uh, to this wonderful event. It's our first really national webinar, um, aimed particularly at student nurses from BME backgrounds, looking at vaccination, the myths, the knowledge, the experience. So I'm really pleased to have with me a, a wonderful panel. I'll just introduce everyone by name really quickly to you. So I've got Vanessa Anthony, who is one of our student nurses at, um, from Greenwich University. Uh, Felicia Kwaku, who is the interim chair of the CNO BME Strategic Advisory Group. Uh, Sheila Sobrani from Middlesex University. Dr. Winston Morgan from University of East London. Professor Geraldine Walters representing us from uh, the Nursing and Midwifery Council. Professor Laura Saren, who's got two hats, um, Professor for Public Health and Community Nursing, and also working with part of AGE as a chief nurse. And uh, Professor Mark Radford, who is uh, Deputy CNO and uh, Chief Nurse for Health Education England, London region. Great. Um, so thank you all. Um, I'm going to keep it really short because we're tight on time. And I'm going to hand over to Mark Radford now, who will um, just help us with setting the scene. And we'll go through today's webinar. Thank you, Mark. Alvin, uh, thank you so much for that really warm welcome and, and uh, afternoon colleagues. It, it is a real uh, pleasure to uh, speak to you all this afternoon and I am extremely grateful to uh, Calvin and LSBU for bringing us together. Um, it started out as a concept a few weeks ago and it was evident on Calvin's passion and drive to engage with our student colleagues about a really important issue about vaccination and BME colleagues that uh, you have such a phenomenal panel here today um, and, and that's a, a huge thanks to, to Calvin and the LSBU team. Um, I think it's really important to reflect. Um, myself as the Chief Nurse Health Education England and Deputy CNO, I've also been working in the National Vaccination Programme as the Workforce Delivery Lead. Um, and I think there are a number of reflections I'd like to make in setting the scene. And, and the first thing to do is to say a thank you, a personal thank you to colleagues out there online today, um, nurses, uh, student nurses, lecturers, academics, clinical staff, 
who have worked tirelessly during uh, the pandemic. And it is a huge, huge amount of respect to all of you and the work that you've achieved in the support of, of managing the complexities of the pandemic in your communities. Whilst like many of us, we have all been under the huge challenges of the social uh, challenges that we've had in relation to the management of a pandemic. However, it, we have to reflect on um, the large number of our citizens who have passed away uh, during the pandemic and importantly reflect the disproportionate nature that has had on um, citizens from a BME background. And I think this has highlighted quite significantly um, some issues and challenges we've known about in our society for many, many years and decades about inequalities, about access to services, about inequalities and in outcomes in health, uh, as well as wider societal uh, issues and challenges uh, for those from a BME background. So it is really important today's event because I think it is important that we have open dialogue about some of these challenges and reflect as a healthcare community and nurses, midwives and AHPs working in the health service about what this means and the sense making we must make out of this. I think it's also important to reflect that, that the work that colleagues have done up and down the country during the pandemic is, is, is amazing. Um, I have been really fortunate to engage with student nurses, midwives and AHPs throughout the pandemic. Um, and their focus on their abilities to support their communities and deliver better outcomes for patients in the most trying of circumstances have been um, uh, nothing short of miraculous. And our academic colleagues, um, and I have to call you out here, Calvin, you know, I know you've been doing clinical shifts yourself as well as supporting students, as well as also running your course. And, and it's colleagues like Calvin up and down the country who have been looking out for students themselves, but also participating in the response against the pandemic, which is inspiring. And I just want to thank colleagues for that. Vaccination um, has always been the potential tool for us to become out of this pandemic. And I do reflect, I keep loads of notes about my experiences. And, and I read in my book that I first noted back in January of last year, about the 9th, something we called then the Wuhan virus um, that was somewhere distant. It was happening somewhere else in the globe. And we were thinking about the potentials and impacts that that would have. And here we are, many months, not just over a year later, having been through one of the biggest global health emergencies that I have ever witnessed or read about. And the impact on our society and also the global society has been huge. And I think this will change our society forever. And in some ways it has to, uh, particularly noting some of the inequalities and the challenges that I've described. But vaccinations is a really important part of that in terms of how do we get through um, the, uh, the nature of the pandemic and vaccinations offers us an opportunity to do that. And, and back when scientists were identifying and how to do this to literally um, months later being able to see the first vaccination being given um, globally um, in Coventry um, by one of our fantastic nurses, May Parsons, who I, I was lucky to talk with uh, very recently. And, and now vaccinating um, uh, nearly uh, 18 million citizens across our country and, and the potential impact in terms of the saving lives. But even during the impact of the vaccination program, which has been led and delivered by scientists and the log logisticians, academics, nurses up and down the country, it has also again, importantly raised some issues around our societal structure and those who we can access and uh, services and I think these are important questions. And I know Marcus later on, who's been actively involved in developing and supporting this, will have lots of insights in terms of the work of the vaccination programme. I think this is a really important conversation. And I'm so delighted that we've got a wide range of views from different communities, different professional backgrounds to help us guide us through this conversation today. And I, I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you once again, Calvin and LSBU for bringing us all together. Um, I think the framing that you've described this conversation, the people that you've brought together to talk about vaccinations, talk about the impact on BME communities and also importantly on healthcare, I think is really important. I'm delighted to be here 
and uh, a personal thank you to each and every one of the colleagues out there for the work that you've been doing in the pandemic. And uh, I, I think I now hand over to uh, Dr. Morgan um, for the next section of, of the event. Or do I hand back to you, Calvin? I'm not quite sure. I think it's a Dr. Morgan next, I think, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's fine. Winston, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. I want to try and share my screen and breeze through. So first of all, can you see my screen? Not yet. Not just yet. Oh, we did. That's not, that's not a good start, is it? Click share again. Um, how about now? Not yet. Yes, we can. Perfect. Right. So um, let me get rid of this, go to slideshow. So I'm going to breeze through. So normally, um, um, colleagues, what I'd normally do is um, give a presentation on why COVID impacts on the AME communities or um, why there's hesitancy. But today I'm specifically going to um, focus on safety of the COVID vaccine because I was looking into the questions that people have been sending in and it's clear to me that the biggest thing rather than efficacy and I think there's been lots in the news about efficacy so I think there's less concern about that what the issue is I, I think is, is around safety and I'm going to put my toxicologist hat on and for those of you who don't know what a toxicologist is if you're developing a new drug like a vaccine you need a toxicologist to be basically go through the data and design the studies and interpret the studies in terms of safety um, uh, as opposed to efficacy. So I'm putting my toxicologist hat on. And the question I'm asking today is what we know about safety and how we know the vaccine is safe. So I'm going to breach through this. I've got five slides. I hope I can do it in time. So safety is the biggest reason for hesitancy, I believe, based on the questions. And how we know the vaccine is safe, basically evidence come and we look for evidence from testing before we actually went uh, to the public to roll out. So I'm gonna show you all the evidence I can as quickly as possible in terms of why I think the vaccine is safe. So at the development stage of the vaccine, when we didn't know much about it, what we did, that's called a preclinical stage. And at that stage, what they did, they used, we call tried and tested technology. So all the materials that goes into the vaccine as well as the delivery systems, they were not new, they were tried and tested. And that's one of the reasons why we were able to develop this vaccine so quickly because no one was reinventing the wheel. We just had a wheel that was already there using a simple term. We also looked to other vaccines, for example, the development of the Ebola vaccine, which is a recent development, even the rabies vaccine, which uh, sort of was developed based on RNA technology and the flu vaccine. All of these were brought together. And we also looked at things like how we are more now treating cancer. For example, there are mRNA cancer vaccines. All that information has been come together. So, and we've put this together and if you like thrown it into the um, new COVID vaccine. So we're not starting from scratch and that's why we've saved so much time in the development stage. Then there were extensive animal testing and any drug that's gonna go into humans must first be tested in animals. So I just wanna briefly tell you what, what, what's happened there and how that helped with our understanding of and why we think the vaccine is safe. So there's been extensive animal testing. And what we know is that there are certain animals and certain tests that we can do for a vaccine that will predict human toxicity. So even though we're not testing it in humans at that time, this is early on, we know from the animal studies what is safe. Just to give you an example of some of the things that they would have done, they would have used doses over 100 times higher than the planned dose in humans. So we're using extra high doses just to check for any possible effects. And also, rather than remembering in, in all these vaccines, and, and this covers all the vaccines, you're either gonna get one dose or two, whereas in the animal test, they did three or four doses. And they basically found no serious or unexpected toxicity. So these were the preliminary developmental stage tests that we did. And as a result of all those tests, we were then able to go if you like, into, oh, sure, there, there's another bit and I can't see that. That's about reproductive toxicity. I should have said, they also did some reproductive toxicity because that's what, one of the questions people ask about um, um, the vaccine, is it safe? And they found no adverse effects on fertility or on the developing fetus. They are still doing studies about, it's like postnatal and development of um, animals that were, te that were sort of treated with the vaccine. But um, chances are there won't be any issues because normally when you have an issue with a new drug or a new vaccine like this, it's going to happen at the event developmental stage or in the fertility stage. So we've done all those tests and they all show there's no serious problems with, with the vaccine. Okay, then, um, having seen that there's safety of the preclinical studies, this led to clinical trials being approved by the regulators. And clinical trials is where you move 
into doing tests in humans, human volunteers. So, and these are unique for this particular vaccine development. First of all, just to remind you what clinical trials are about, there's normally four phases, phase one, two, three, and four. In phase one, you are basically looking for issues around safety. Then in phase two, you're testing whether the vaccine does what it's supposed to do. So in phase two, they would have been looking for, what was the vaccine giving you um, good T cell activation and also good antibody production? And that was proven. Once you've got that phase two, they then expanded it numbers wise. So you'd have got phase one, it might be traditionally be about 10, 20 people, phase two, about 20 to 50 people. And then phase three, you might get up to 1,000, 2,000 people. Phase four is quite the interesting one because that's post-marketing. So it's on the market and, and, we're, and, and it's been given to people. It's in roller and you still keep testing. So that's how we know something is safe. So going back to this particular COVID vaccine, as I said, normally you might have, particularly at phase three, perhaps about three, 4,000 people. With this vaccine, they had tens of thousands of people instead of a few thousand. So the power of the statistics was much, much stronger in terms of what we could learn from the clinical trials. These are the first trials in humans, uh, human volunteers. Also, they used diverse populations. They tested in populations in the UK, in Brazil, in South Africa, in, in the USA. And they also tested in different races and ethnicities. So what you've got is very broad coverage of, um, of, of the vaccine. So all of the, so, sorry, of, of what the vaccine could do. So someone saying it wasn't tested in people like me, chances are it was because it's been so widely tested. And it's a requirement of, if you like, the, the, um, the, the FDA, for example, you have to test in all the different groups, okay? Also, in terms of the testing procedures, they had lots of regulators. So all the regulators, MHRA, you might have heard about them, they would have basically put everything else they're doing to one side and just focus on COVID testing. So that enabled them to work much faster rather than in the past they'd have waited until they were free to, to look at uh, results. The other thing they did was, because people complained about this went really quickly, the studies were done in parallel. So as soon as they did phase one, even before they got the outcomes in phase one, they started on phase two. And they would have only have gone back to phase one or stopped the test if there was something wrong. But clearly there was nothing wrong as they went through the phases. So that's another reason why things developed so quickly. We also had large government investments, so um, companies could do, do their work um, with less risk, and so they were able to put, again put more resources in, and that speeded up the process. And then we had unprecedented scientific involvement and cooperation. So scientists like me and others, they basically really sort of um, um, cooperated in a way they'd never cooperated before, and that made a big difference in terms of how the vaccine was rolled out. Okay. And what they did from all these clinical trials, they found side effects, which were predicted from the animal studies, but no serious adverse effects, which are, which are gonna prevent us from going forward with the vaccine. Okay, so let's move on to the other one. And then they so basically they got emergency use authorization. So if we then go into rollout, that means to the general public. And so far, there's been over a hundred million people, not just in the UK, but in America and in all the other countries where the vaccines have been approved, over 100 million people have now had the vaccine. So again, that's additional testing. So if there are any serious problems, we'll know about it. So let's just have a quick look at some of the things that we've discovered from the, from the rollout so far. Okay, side effects, there are definitely side effects. We can't um, pretend there are no side effects and side effects are normal. But if you think about side effects, they're not as serious compared to what could happen to you if you get COVID. Also the side effects are very short term days as opposed to you know weeks and and you generally recover from them so the side effects you're normally likely to get 70 percent 70 percent roughly of people will get um pain at the injection site and that will last for about three four days or so some people will get headache about 35 percent some people will get be fatigued or even fever much less um of that but generally as i said you tend to get these effects or well, most people notice these more after the second second dose it's not more painful it's just that some people might not notice in the first dose they'd notice it in the second dose but these are the side effects so when people talk about side effects these are the things we're talking about now in terms of serious adverse effects which is what really concerns people both from the animal testing and also from the humans there are very few of those and what those are we can protect predict them and the main ones have been the anaphylaxis that people have talked about but these are very very rare 10 to 20 per million dose, so very, very few. And these tend to, they might affect your blood pressure, they might, might have, you might have difficulty breathing. Um, but what we find is that these only occurred in people who had 
severe allergic reactions anyway. And what people were told is if you have severe allergic reactions to the vaccine contents, and later on I can sort of briefly talk about the vaccine contents, then you shouldn't take it. And so, and also the other thing about these um, 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 anaphylaxis, they're serious at the time, but they're easily treated and everyone who's had an anaphylactic response to um, the vaccine have recovered fully. But if you think of not taking the vaccine and getting COVID, even think of long COVID, that's gonna be a big problem. Okay, I'm almost finished, don't worry. The other thing that people talk about is deaths. Now, the Office for National Statistics said that for every 100,000 doses given to people over 80, naturally 200 people will die anyway as a result of natural causes. So lots of people have seen these stories of people dying after getting the vaccine. But remember, most people who've got the vaccine are quite old, over 70, over 80. And naturally, lots of people will die. And it's just a coincidence. It has nothing to do with the vaccine. So there are no deaths likely to be linked to the vaccine that we have found. Finally, this is my last slide. Uh, um, what normally um, causes vaccine safety issues? I just want to remind people what those are. Not all sugar. So, okay. The main problem uh, is from live viruses going wrong. So normally, historically, we've used live viruses for vaccines, but we're not using those. And we've also learned how to use live attenuated viruses. So that's not a problem. So you can't, don't worry about that. Okay, getting the dose wrong, because we've had such extensive um, clinical trials and preclinical trials, we've got the dose right. So all you're seeing is the efficacy effect, but very little adverse effects. And yes, the side effects, we know about those, but those are not comparable to getting um, COVID itself. Then there are the complications with ingredients. That's where you get the, the anaphylaxis and the adverse reactions. Again, we know what those um, the contents of the vaccine is, and people are told, so if you have those allergy to any of the contents, you will not be given the vaccine. Um, and finally, as I said, the fact that they have now approved trials in pregnant women, because lots of people worry about it, um, tells you that if there are any issues around pregnancy, getting pregnant and developing fetus with the vaccine, they, wouldn't have, they would not have now um, started to approve trials for pregnant women, okay? Remember, lots of people, although they didn't have um, pregnant women in the original clini clinical trials, because humans are humans, and because there were so many thousands of people who took part in the trials, lots of people got pregnant during when they were on the trials. So we know that the vaccines really didn't affect a man's ability to father children or a woman's ability to conceive children. And so far, all the people who were on trials who um, uh, became pregnant, they're now being followed quite closely and there have been no reports of anyone having any um, adverse problems. And I think that's it really. So thank you very much. I know it's, it's a breeze through, but I thought it's really important to um, just to sort of talk about the, um, the impact of um, the, the safety aspects of the vaccine. I hope I, I was in time there, I don't know. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Winston. Neil? Slightly over, but all good, all good, all good. We can we can make up time. Um, so we are about to launch a quick poll before we hand over to Professor Geraldine Waters. So um, I've just launched a poll on the screen and I'm just going to read that out to you. So just a quick question, um, just one question. Have you had the COVID-19 vaccine, um, either one or both parts? So if um, we could just take a couple of minutes just for our audience to answer that question, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Lots of lots of quick responses there, which we like to see. So, just realised no, I couldn't do because, it. No, I think all the panels can't vote. Thank you. <laughs> I was clicking away, Calvin, but I, <laughs> I was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there it goes. So we've got seventy-eight percent of you have voted. So nice and quickly. That's perfect. Thank you. There you go. We give um, give it another half a minute. And we'll be doing um, we'll be doing a poll at the end as well. So, I, Winston, I think there were some questions that were raised in the Q and A, um, which pertaining to your discussion. So I'm sure later on in the second half, you know, we get to that as well. So Happy to do that. Asking that. Happy to do that. Yes. Perfect. Just to let our audience know, we aren't using the raise your hand function during this during this event. Um, so I'm going to call it there. We've got most of the votes in. Another ten seconds. There you go, and we're going to launch those. So Calvin, I'll hand over to you to talk through those results. Okay, so here we go. Wow, um, do we share, would everybody else see the screen or not? Or is just- Yes, um, they can, it yeah, out? they can. Okay, so there we go. Um, so this is our pre-post, um, our pre-poll rather. 
and 79% of you all have said, or 79 people, 45% have said you've had the vaccine. 34% 34 I have not had the vaccine yet, but I am planning to. I am hesitant, 19%, and I don't want to have the vaccine, 2%. So we're gonna do a, another um, post this discussion poll to see how people's minds have changed and what, what where we're getting to. Okay, well, thank you all very much for that. So Geraldine, over to you, Professor Geraldine Walters from the NMC. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Calvin, um, and thank you for organising this. Um, sure. Winston, I always think people with slides and data, they always make me feel very jealous because I think you've got, <laughs> <laughs> you've got the really interesting stuff. Um, so, I mean, what a year it's it's been, you know, and just reflecting a little bit as Mark has done, it's really uh, brought out the best in our professions and it's made that very plain for everybody else to see in society as well but that's been at a cost um, especially to our BME community who work in healthcare. Uh, so at the NMC uh, really we're trying to focus on how can we uh, use our professionalism to sort of help us through this, uh, how do we come out stronger um, and how do we use this experience to to build our resilience um, and capitalize on on the love and support that we've got from society rather than uh, let it sort of uh, really bring us down so i mean in terms of uh vaccines uh, most people say is the nmc going to tell me i've got to have the vaccine um well we're very good at having high level standards which you could almost say don't don't sort of tell you anything but the clues are all in there so no vaccine is mandatory in the UK but what your professional code says is that you must maintain your own level of health and you should take reasonable precautions to avoid health risks to other people and that really applies to flu it replies it applies to MMR um, any vaccine which uh, if you are working in uh, an environment where people may be at risk if you can have the vaccine then you probably should um, but we know there are good reasons why some people might not be able to have the vaccine. So we ask them to take reasonable precautions to try and uh, prevent any risks themselves or others. And the other thing uh, that we ask people to do is to make informed decisions based on good evidence. So in terms of vaccine, that's kind of it in a nutshell. If you can have it, uh, if there's a good reason for you to for you not to have it, then we're not going to pressurise you to have it. But um, you must take all precautions to reduce any risks as a result. Um, I'm going to leave it there, Calvin, um, because I think there may be more questions and we can enlarge on that. And perhaps you can uh, gather a bit of your time back. So thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Um, yeah, we. Um, I, I anticipate we will have questions around the NMC, and that was good time to have yourself for Andrew here. So thank you. Um, next um, up is um, really and truly um, the person who I was my go-to person to help get this uh, webinar started, Felicia Kwaku. Felicia, I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, thank you so much for supporting this event through the CNO's BME Strategic Advisory Group. I think you're muted, Felicia. Can you hear me? I'm um, just going now. to try and share my screen. Uh, you let me know if you can see the screen. Yes, it's loading, I think. So yes, we can. You can see the screen. You, might have, yeah, you may have to go into slide view. Okay. So presentation mode, because we only seeing half of your slide. Okay. That's it. Right, okay then. So um, it's really good to be here. Um, I'm just going to go over a few things. One of the things that this this is the picture. So, uh, so my name is Felicia Kwaku. I'm also um, a nurse, and I um, I'm the interim chair of the Chief Nursing Officers BME Strategic Advisory Group. And I worked during the first and the second wave. And I know that uh, many of you students would have done the same. And I remember in April, May, we started to see. Um, well, I would say from March, we started to see significant deaths amongst healthcare workers. And I remember the first 10 uh, healthcare worker staff that died were doctors and they were from um, black minority and Asian communities. And this gentleman here is my colleague, Dr. Alpha Sardu, who I worked with very closely. And I, I, couldn't, absolute, I couldn't believe that um, he passed away. 
And then we came to April, May, and we started to see the numbers rise. And you will see from this picture that amongst all the people that, that died at that time, we do have a mixture of ethnicities, but the most significant thing about this picture is that the majority of staff are from black, minority and Asian communities. And so we saw um, a lot of information coming through. We saw two significant reports, one from the Institute of Fiscal Studies and another report from the Office of National Statistics. And they told us uh, this. They told us that if you were from a ethnic um, community, if you were a, a black male, black female, your likelihood of dying was 4.3, 4.4 times likely. If you were from an Asian background, it was around approximately 2.9 uh, likelihood. So we knew that there was a problem fairly early on. And I say this is really important because when you look at the makeup of the NHS, 40% uh, of doctors within the NHS come from a um, ethnic background and 20% of nurses come from um, an ethnic background. And this was data taken in June where it, it, this, was, this is uh, oh, nearly a year's worth of data. And that, at that time, there were 216 NHS staff deaths. And most of the deaths occurred in the inpatient settings. But when they once again broke down the ethnicity, at least 62% of the staff that had died were from a black and Asian minority background. And so this slide is, is pretty important because we know that there is strong evidence that links occupational exposure to um, the increase in contracting the virus, but also in death. And you will see from uh, the, the, the bands, these are the grades, that if, if you're in band five, band six, the red bar represents BME staff, and that's where most BME staff are clustered. So they're clustered in the lower bands, and where you see junior staff is on the ground floor looking after patients in high, in high numbers. And this is disproportionate to um, um, issues around discrimination and lack of career progression. So as staff started to tell us these concerns, there's one thing about having anecdotal stories and um, um, recollections, and then there's, nothing, there's another thing about what they're actually saying. So we as a group held a series of telephone conferences um, as engagement events to actually ask what the real questions were. And these engagement events gave us um, a real opportunity for them to have a safe space and to tell us what was going on. And this is what they told us. They told us if you were an agency nurse, that you were left to the side, you didn't really have any rights. They told us that they were being discriminated against, that, that some of the managers were hiding PPE. There was an issue with the face masks, um, that staff weren't having risk assessments. And they, uh, there was a lot of staff that were experiencing psychological trauma and a real impact on their mental health and well-being, as well as um, the lack of testing for staff. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that's much better now. So those are the key things that they told us. And based on what they told us, we made a whole list of recommendations, which you can see on the screen. And that um, list of recommendations has fed into a national piece of work um, around the five work streams that the Chief Nursing Officer of this country is leading on around the, the Black and minority ethnic workforce. Uh, and, and the purpose of that is to improve the safety and the protection of staff. So as I'm, I'm going to end now, um, but I'm gonna show you just one more thing. This is one of my matrons, Richard. He contracted COVID in the first wave. Um, he was in intensive care. He was on ECMO, which is a form of bypass machinery. And I can tell you now that if he'd had the vaccine, if the vaccine was available, then he would have taken it. And this is some of my staff as we are on the ground floor. So I just want to leave you with a few things. Um, this second wave, in the second wave, working on the ground floor, it's worse. It was worse than the first wave. Uh, these are the staff that, this is more staff that have died. And if I tell you two weeks ago, there were eight staff, eight nursing staff that died. And since then, there's another three. So I've seen 11 um, nursing staff die from COVID and one of them was my own. So the issue around taking the vaccine is your own. It's a personal choice, but make your choice based on evidence and not mythology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felicia. Um, uh, you've really set the scene on how to think and um, to recognize that, you know, 
vaccine hesitancy is one area, but this really re revolves around structural racism and how we approach that. And there is an issue of structural racism and racism on the whole, or on how black people's health is addressed and why they are hesitant at times. Um, at this stage, I want to, um, we've got Marcus Riddle, who's going to join us from NHS EI. If I got that right, Marcus, thank you. I'm just going to hand over to you. You could uh, say who you are and just over to you for your, your spot. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Kevin, for inviting me today. So I'm Marcus Riddle, I'm NHS England's Head of Equality and Inclusion Policy. Uh, I'm also the head of a uh, staff vaccination team for the Chief People Officer, uh, specifically for staff working in secondary care uh, settings. So I'll briefly touch on, you know, broadly what we're doing uh, ob objective-wise, and then I will kind of follow up uh, what Felicia's uh, said, because I think it's really important for the work we're trying to do. So uh, firstly, um, I suppose unsurprisingly, as you do in you know, organisations like mine, we're kind of looking at gathering uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, data on staff uptake. I, I can't share the data that I have now seen, but I can give you a broad brush about what the uptake is telling us. So we've got increasingly good data from the electronic staff record, from the point of care vaccination data systems, uh, and of course, uh, the kind of manual uh, data sets that a lot of organizations give us. Um, and the second uh, bit of work, which is certainly the, the, the biggest and more time consuming is our staff engagement program, which is a combination of uh, the chief people officers speaking to uh, Don, speaking to HRD, speaking to uh, uh, Coos, et cetera, about their you know, accountability for ensuring their staff are vaccinated and how we can engage with staff. But we're also doing more importantly for, for COVID and the entire response, but particularly for vaccinations, uh, a lot more direct engagement with BME staff some of that's in, again, the forums, you might expect, the BME staff networks, the representative bodies and so on. But increasingly what we've been trying to do uh, is, in some sense, break down BAME, because actually in the context of the vaccination rollout, it's not proving massively uh, helpful, because what we can see from the data we have is uh, hesitancy, as we call it, is not kind of uniform. Uh, so, for example, uh, current data suggests that for Indian staff, the uh, vaccine uptake at this stage is pretty similar to uh, to white staff in secondary care settings. So this doesn't include uh, primary care. And as I say, if I, if I could share the data in full, I would. Um, but it's the hesitancy is very high for uh, Bangladeshi, African, and Caribbean uh, staff, and that's because to some extent uh, the personal drivers for the hesitancy are just slightly different. And you know. Uh, I'm on a panel of, of healthcare professionals here. You don't stop being, uh, you know, uh, Asian or, or black or Filipino, whatever it may be, when you go into work. You know, you're, this is your, you're from your community first and foremost. And a lot of the concerns people are carrying into the workplace. So uh, I think it's worth me stressing once I've got the chance that there's going to be no, uh, and there is no uh, kind of stigmatization of, of healthcare workers from NHS England uh, who are hesitant or who want to have these type of conversations here about why they haven't been vaccinated yet. Um, I'll be completely transparent. I will be uh, vaccinated when called. I've, I've managed to persuade uh, parents and grandparents, et cetera, to be, to be vaccinated. Uh, but it wasn't straightforward necessarily. Uh, you know, as a Caribbean person, we've got personal and professional reasons as well to be hesitant. Um, for us, it was actually quite straightforward. You know, my uh, parents came here in the Windrush generation. Um, and uh, there's, no, there's, there's no discernible change in their treatment by the authorities since they came here. That, that was, that's their kind of reading of it. So uh, when the authorities say, we've got this vaccine, please trust us, it's not enough. You know, so for you know, a lot of NHS staff, uh, you know, just because they work for the NHS, there's no guarantee that they would just be okay. And that's why we have to have these conversations. And furthermore, I know some of you will have spotted today, we published the, uh, 2020 Workforce Race Equality Standard Report. Uh, and what that tells us, because it's mainly based on data from 2019 and early 2020, is the conditions on which NHS workers entered the pandemic. And for a lot of the people who are listening to this webinar, uh, we entered it with a far worse experience in the workplace, which led to the specific points raised by Felicia around risk assessments, around PPE, and ultimately, uh, unfortunately, around death, because we were disproportionately affected and we're disproportionately in lower bands, et cetera, for a reason. You know, it hasn't just happened by accident. So, um, you know, we've got to, 
part of our approach here, I guess, on, on vaccination uptake is to face the reality of why people are hesitant and not just say it's your duty to be vaccinated because healthcare professionals, you know, as, as Geraldine kind of touched on, they, they understand uh, the duties of the job uh, and nobody's uh, just, you know, thinking about their vaccination uh, in terms of I don't need to have it. I think people kind of recognize what, the, you know, their job as healthcare workers, their, their requirements, but it's not an easy decision. It's quite a hard decision and it's hard for everyone, but I think it's particularly hard if you've been uh, faced with uh, personally and professionally uh, difficulties with the authorities, especially if you work uh, in a place where you've had those difficulties. So um, I, before I finish, I, I just wanted to touch on um, Oren Okomina, who was a a student nurse who, who passed away from COVID last week, who didn't get to didn't get to work his first fully qualified shift. I, I'm not a nurse, but it it did hurt me quite a lot. It hurt me quite a lot, I must say, because I just over the last year, uh, as Alicia sort of flashed up on the screen there, we just seen so many people pass away, uh, so many, so many healthcare workers pass away, and you just it just struck me, even though even for myself and my family, it took us a long time to come around to the idea of the the vaccine. That if only he'd had the chance, you know, and he'd been vaccinated, he could have worked his, his, imagine how proud he would have been to have got to that point. So, you know, people will take their, uh, their own personal decision, as Felicia said, but I, I agree with her. I hope it's a kind of a really well-informed decision based on these type of conversations. And of course, I, I would love for everyone listening to be vaccinated because ultimately uh, the biggest risk to us, as, as proved by Byron, is, is, is COVID. That's the biggest risk here. Uh, it's not the vaccine, and I hope we can persuade people of that in this conversation today. Thanks very much, Calvin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, thank you so much. So we're going to move on because um, we want to keep to time. Um, the next section is really looking at supporting students. And um, well, I'm going to first hand over to Sheila Sobrani, who is from Middlesex University. Sheila. Um, hi. Um... Thank you very much for attending the webinar this afternoon. I'm just going to share my screen just to show you a little bit about what I do. Um, so um, this is the Student Healthcare Academics um, Race Equality Diversity Inclusivity Network at Middlesex University. This is only a third of the size of the network. It's actually really big. And um, we have been running this network um, as a mirror group to BME academics um, who actually, here we go, sorry, there we go, that's what we look like as teachers. So um, you're probably wondering why I'm showing you that, and the reason I'm showing you that is because um, we have created that group so we can talk to our students in a way that they can understand and the way they can relate to us as lecturers and because we identify with them on their journey. And when Covid hit us um, in March last year, everyone uh, in the university went into a form of shock really because that meant the university shut down as many universities across London and also um, we lost a student last year sadly it was one of our uh, students that we worked in the community with and so it was very close to us in our classrooms and the impact also of isolation and um, actually going out frontline and the fear of actually maybe contracting the virus was there. So I'm thinking in terms of moving forward, our students have raised concerns and I do, I do appreciate everyone has concerns about the vaccine, um, whether it's you know the safety, but you've got, seen all the evidence there about the testing and the trials and some wonderful experts on the panel here this, this afternoon uh, are talking about it, but we, the whole idea is for you to talk in a safe space, a safe psychological space about your concerns um, and without feeling that, you know, you're going to be pressured or victimised into making a decision. But I'm thinking, um, for me personally, I had my concerns, as many of my students did, but actually did get vaccinated because we are thinking about our future. Many of our students are working in isolation behind Zoom but also want the university feel we want to get back to normal and actually meet our teachers and meet our students face to face and also celebrate them graduating. You know, these are things that we look forward to. So um, I'm very grateful. Thank you very much um, for inviting me to talk, Calvin. And I'll just um, stop there. 
and I'll be open to any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. And what a wonderful group support network uh, you've developed for students from BME background. Um, the next person I'm handing over to is Professor Laura Sarant. And to be honest with you all, um, most of you who know Professor Sarant's work around the sciences framework, um, it's really struck a chord with me. And that's why one of the reasons I've done really wanted to host this webinar, because I realized we were talking about everyone else who are healthcare professionals, but we weren't hearing the voices or we weren't listening to the silences in our student community. And um, so Laura, I'll hand over to you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Calvin, and uh, thank you, Sheila. Um, I think you've raised some really important points there, Sheila, about um, what it feels like to be a, a, an academic and a member that supports students through their programme and their training, their education, to both witness this from both sides, really. So um, in the first wave of, of COVID, I was working as a head of department in uh, nursing in Manchester Metropolitan University. So I've, I've supported students and the staff as well we had around the initial fear about uh, COVID and also about witnessing the, the high rates of, of deaths across the um, professional uh, family really. And this time I'm seeing it from the other side in, in my role as regional um, head of nursing for health education England. My job is really about making sure that we, we support the opportunities for students to be safe, but also to have the best experiences in their learning. So working both with providers and, and your providers of placements and working with the universities to kind of help you as students um, have the, the best support that you can get and the best programmes and the best experiences of health. And for me, standing as somebody who is a member of the BME group, we have, again, with the other chief nurses, we're a diverse group of, of heads of nursing across HEE, um, thanks to Mark and, and the HEE support team and Ruth May. And we see this on both sides. So we understand the concerns, both personally and professionally. But, you know, as Calvin says, the, it's really important to take advantage of the opportunity to just talk about what's worrying you, whether that's with your tutors, college, or whether if you have concerns that we can help with at Health Education England, because that is also part of our role. We've had lots of webinars um, and even more hopefully coming in the future. And this is one opportunity. Know that there are people who are just trying to help you so that you have the opportunity to give and be your best. Because it's really, really important to us that we have a diverse healthcare workforce to support a di the diverse communities. And as Calvin says, that if we don't actually speak and hear our own stories and talk about our stories, other people will speak for us with no evidence. And then at best what will happen is that they'll get the stories wrong. And at worst, we'll be silent. And silence is the thing that is most dangerous to us in this space. Thank you, Calvin. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, yes, I, I'm going to move on to Vanessa. Um, Vanessa. This is about student nurses. And, um, and we know there are many of you out there, but um, I'd hand over to Vanessa, who is a student nurse. So just really, Vanessa is going to help us share her experience and help set the context for the Q&A that's going to come up after this session. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, thank you, Calvin. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to, to particip participate today. Um, I'm the, those of you that don't know me, I'm actually the London representative for the RCN Student Committee. Um, as I sit here today, I'm actually um, going through, um, I've just been recently signposted to counselling services for experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder and I've, I've worked through the first wave under a paid placement and most recently uh, with, within my su superiority status I've been in a 100% COVID area so I've seen devastation I've experienced trauma and there may be some of you out there today going through the same as well um, what, what I really want to emphasize today is that indeed um, Professor Lauren uh, Sarant spoke about it, Sheila spoke about it, about opening up to your lecturers, your you know, assessors in placement and what have you. However, in practical terms, it's, it's far easier to say than do. From a student perspective where you are out there, okay, we're in the middle of the pandemic. 
you've got workers shielding, self-isolating. So whereas as students, as we are out there, yes, we may should be protected by supernumerary status. However, the reality is we are put into situations where we are counted in the numbers. Um, in, in practical terms, you know, from, from that perspective, we're not safe. In terms of leading by example also, um, I've had reports whereby staff, again, because of the barriers, in particular to those from um, to those professionals from black and minority, minority ethnic backgrounds, who themselves have said, you know, they are undecided if they are going to undertake the vaccine. Um, they're going to, you know, they're going to be a, basically a bystander and onlook and see in the long term after the, you know, the, the initial vaccination program has been rolled out, how many are going to be affected and if there are going to be positive outcomes. For those of us that have had a straightforward decision to say, yes, we're going to take the vaccine, there have been barriers in accessing the vaccine. Now, in some setups, yes, you, you've got some trust, you're included, uh, treated as a member of staff, and particularly after the HEE publication of students being treated, you, um, to enable students to be treated with the safety measures just as staff. Again, but in the reality, it doesn't always happen. Um, students, despite proving who they are, their status and what have you, have been turned away in situations. So again, that's another barrier and it's a form of exclusion. Um, also, again, with the withdrawal of the student bursary as well, many of us have to work part time alongside our studies and the most practicable way is usually within the healthcare system. I've had reports of students who, again, their employer have said to them, well, look, if you don't undertake the vaccine, therefore, the, the employment opportunities are going to be limited to you. Again, another form of exclusion. What do you do? There's that, you know, feeling of coercion. You must have the vaccine or else or a threat of losing your, your second income. And then on to add to this, you've got all the different types of communication that are out there. Now, we are in an era of social media and, you know, lots of digital influences. And again, not everyone, um, some people are quite easily influenced and, you know, take on board what's out there. And it's to decipher all the information that's coming at you. We need something that's... Um, where the wording is not ambiguous, it's not coercive, and again, it's factual and it's informing to enable you to make some form of decision. And I think the final thing I'd like to cover as well, now, we all come from different backgrounds, we're diverse and what have you, and yet some of us may have the conflict of our personal values and insights versus the professional values that we're governed by. Again, you've got the we, we're governed by the NMC code, etc. When we're out there in practice, that is our career moving forward. But then we've got our own personal values. It you know some are inherent, some you know we learn from within our culture. Some are related to our religion, our religious practices, and this is you know because of our intersectionality. What do you do? Do you put your personal views first or you, do you go with the evidence? So this is why we have this dilemma again. This is why we've got this hesitancy also. Anyway, I'm really conscious of time, so I will leave it there. And I'm sure we've got more opportunity within the Q&A session to discuss more issues relating to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, so I'm going to wrap up quickly, and then I think Neil, will we do the second poll now, or the beginning of the next session? We'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll do some Q and A's, and then we'll do the second poll. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, um, just to wrap up really quickly. Thank you all very much, um, Vanessa. You're really setting the scene for us because this conversation is really with our student body. We really want to know what's happening. Also for the educators, nurse educators who are online. Um, Although we say that people should come to nurse educators, sometimes nurse educators don't have all the answers. So today is about learning about that as well. Um, so thank you very much. Um, two things that strike me is, you know, um, Mark said, um, what sense do we make out of our experiences? And Laura ended up with saying that, you know, don't let other people tell your story because, um, you know, then you become really silent in that respect and they may get your story wrong. So the next session really and truly is let's try and see how we can make some sense of our experience 
all of our other panelists have really set the scene in giving us some statistics, telling us about safety, telling us about the profession and you know where we stand with regulation. So it's really interesting. Um, we're going to take a, Neil, I'm going to hand over back to you because you know what's going to happen sure. next. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So, so we've got time, some time for some questions that have come in through the Q&A box. Um, all of our panellists, you can see them all on screen now. Um, panellists, if there's a particular question you want to answer, please um, alert me. You can either raise your hand or just signal and I'll come over to you. In the interest of time, we will just take a couple of responses to each question. OK, so the first one um, that's got the most votes in the box that wants to be answered is why is it that most people that have had the Oxford vaccine reported having severe side effects and the Pfizer vaccine? Who would like to answer that? Is there anyone on the panel? Yep. OK, Mark. Oh, I, 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 sorry. I'm, I'm going to default to Dr. Morgan, um, but I can help <laughs> answer it as well. <laughs> Perfect, thank no, you. No, all I was going to say, I, I haven't seen that data, so I, I, and I, I don't know that it, that's actually true. Um, for, for example, the number of people who've had the Pfizer vaccine and the number of people who've had the um, AstraZeneca vaccine are very different. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't accept that because it, I haven't seen that data. And I haven't heard it discussed in, in, with people who, who know about these things. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, just, just to reinforce what Dr. Morgan said, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that the, the two the two vaccines are are different in their production methods. Two different organisations in terms of uh, who produce them. They have different profiles um, um, in terms of kind of um, implications and um, associated known uh, challenges uh, after a vaccination. But I, I have not heard of a significant differential between either vaccination that one is creating more adverse effects than another. Um, but, you know, one would expect differences, but not in terms of total number of, uh, of complications. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Maria. Um, when trials initially were carried out, it was suggested that second dose must be given in three weeks. I understand that the government had to make a difficult decision to give the first dose to as many people as possible. How effective would the vaccine be if the second dose is given within 12 weeks? It's a controversial issue which many people do not understand. Please could you explain from a scientific background? We'll come to you, Winston. Right. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, um, well, the data actually shows, because they've done studies with the Oxford vaccine, and it actually shows that as, over time, you actually get better results if you leave the intervals longer. They haven't done as much studies with the uh, Pfizer, but even those studies are showing that it's not going to make any difference um, over at least 12 weeks. So the answer is, um, and also when you think about it from an immunological point of view, it also makes sense. There's no reason why after three, four weeks, you suddenly things would drop off and you have to have the second dose then. I mean, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is which has just got approval and is a very similar vaccine to the Astro vaccine, they only have one dose. So, yeah, so the answer is, uh, I don't think it's, a, it's a, something to worry about. Thank you. Um, for those who have a phobia of needles and may not proceed with a vaccine, are there any plans to, 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 to have a new delivery method? And Mark, I know you're keen to answer this one. Yeah, I was going to I was going to try and answer that one. Um, yeah, we know um, that uh, somewhere between fifteen and seventeen percent of the general population have a, a needle phobia, and that's one of the reasons why I talk about vaccinations and immunisations, and not the common parlance that I see across social media of jabs, because <laughs> that has a, an implication in terms of how people perceive it. So at, at, at this stage, yes, it is a it is a, an injection based delivery modality. There have been some reports of manufacturers looking at other ways of doing this. But in the phases of uh, vaccination delivery, we, we are considering at the moment it will be injection based. However, saying that. I do understand people's needle phobia. What is really important is to engage with your healthcare professional to understand the reasons for needle phobia. And there are many, many techniques that people can use and be supported with that, that enable them to, to um, not necessarily stop being needle phobic, but at least manage some of the, 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 the anxieties and worries that needle phobia creates. So uh, please engage with your healthcare professional because there are opportunities to, to have supportive um, uh, interventions that enable you to have a, a vaccine. But like I say, that people are working on some options, but they're, they're gonna be a little while off. Thank you. 
Um, next question um, from uh, Coltoom. Um, why are there so many types of the vaccine? That is making me hesitant because I'm not sure which one to take. Um, well, Winston, Mark, <laughs> Winston, we'll come to you. Winston, yeah. <laughs> It's a Mark well, and Winston well, show, you know. <laughs> well, if you think about it, when when, when the, the governments around the world sort of said, right, we need a vaccine, lots of companies were given lots of money to develop the vaccines. And so they started off, I think there were about 100 different um, approaches, and it's been narrowing down. What we found now is that a lot of companies who started off have given up their, 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 their capacity and sort of helping other companies. So it's, it's narrowed down to, I think, um, at the moment, there's only two or three in this country in America about the same. We'll probably end up with about four or five. And that's a good thing because you, you can get um, diversity of immunization if you like. So one vaccine might give you one set of immunity and another vaccine might give you a slightly different set of immunity. But yeah, it, it just happens that at the start, we didn't know which one was gonna work. So we had to have not only different companies with different approaches. So the, the, the Oxford vaccine uses a, um, um, a viral vector approach, whereas the, um, the, the um, Pfizer and Moderna uses a, um, a lipid nano um, particle kind of approach. So it, it's just different ways of solving the same problem. Thank you. Um, there's a question about allergies. So there is more than one vaccine available. In terms of allergies such as egg, shellfish, what's the current advice? I, 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 if that's what you again, Winston, that's fine. No, I sat next to a GP and she, and, and she said that, um, well, her, her, I'm using her words, yeah, she said that, there were, that, that, that sh it shouldn't make a difference because if you think of what's in the vaccine, um, you're only not supposed to have the vaccine if you have a specific allergy to the constituents of the vaccine. And you'll probably know, your GP will probably know. And as far as I know, there are sort of like shellfish allergy doesn't, wouldn't normally come into that but I would all with something like this I would always talk to my GP or my health professional uh, before before doing it if you have serious allergies. Thank you. Um, who is liable if I get side effects? That's a really interesting question Neil. Um, obviously um, the assessment process is really really quite critical in relation to um, the assessment process to make sure that, you know, but we know that there are side effects that need to be excluded. Uh, the government have agreed a, a mechanism nationally um, against the implications of, of side effects. And, and, and this is partly due to the regulatory environment we work in with a vaccine that has been developed um, and is also uh, being implemented under emergency authorization. So the, the government have provided an insurance uh, system for uh, any consequences associated with, with vaccination. So um, it, it is important for people to be reassured that, that vaccination injury or vaccination complications, even with the early data that we have globally with these two vaccines is extremely low. Um, that, um, you know, both, uh, one of the questions I often get asked is, will I be liable as an individual practitioner? Well, not because of the impact of the vaccine if it's, if it's determined to have been an issue but of course if 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 as a clinician i, I fail to address somebody's um, um uh, health assessment needs and then give the vaccine knowing that they have got a severe allergy to a known vaccine complication there's a there's a, an accountability issue but not in relation to the complications associated with the vaccine on this emergency licensing arrangement thank you um, might you throw got... something in there because it, no, yeah, it's, it's quite important that people don't confuse this um no one is liable if you for a side effect, because a side effect, we know what it is. And a side effect is a sore arm or a headache or a feeling tired or a slight fever. And that will go away over a few days. So lots of people keep saying side effects. The thing to worry about are adverse effects. And I said, those are really, uh, uh, the data that I showed, and that's the last I saw, was um, 10 to 20 in a million doses. So there are lots of side effects, uh, but they'll go away. And you don't expect to get any compensation for that. It, it, it's a consequence of uh, taking a vaccine, but adverse effects, yes, then, uh, then Mark's answer would um, definitely hold. Thank you. Um, we've got another question. Um, why would someone that has built natural immunity need the vaccine? Oh. <laughs> You'd like to go, Winston? <laughs> well, what they found is that um, 
because the national na natural immunity doesn't give you as good immunity as the the vaccines because the vaccines were designed to give you maximum immunity so if you if you've had the virus you don't know how strong that immunity is and how long that will last whereas with the virus sorry with a vaccine i should say with a vaccine you, you have you, you'll get much better immunity and it's it's like a belt i see as belt and braces you will get more immunity by having both the vaccine as well as if you've been uh, previously immunized so i wouldn't if, if i was offered the, va the vaccine and i had been uh, and I had the virus previously, I, I would still take it. Yeah. Can't do anything. Thank you. Um, so we've got lots of questions in there. So if our panelists do have a specific question that you'd like to answer, please um, click that you would like to answer that question. And we'll try and get through as many as we can in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so there's been a couple of Bell's palsy um, with the vaccine, a couple of cases of Bell's palsy with the vaccine. There's a local lady who developed this after her vaccine last week. How long will she have this? Is it reversible? And how do we know that we won't be one of these cases? Who'd, who'd like to tackle that one, Mark? So, so I don't. The simple answer is I don't know. So I've not heard any case reports in relation to, to Bell's palsy, and and obviously the clinical indications of, of that individual. So uh, I'm I'm very happy to go back and, and discuss with the vaccine team in relation to that. And I'm, I'm not a clinician who's come across uh, the management of Bell's palsy in, in the medium to long term. So I'd probably um, not be the best person to advise on that. Okay something we can come back to it, it's, um, it's just one of those things that sort of occur and there, there's been no connection but it, it's one if you vaccinate enough people someone will get it okay as far again as far as all the data i've seen is there's no link to the vaccine thank you um i have a bame nurse friend who had the vaccine and had full covid symptoms for 10 days it is unclear if this is because of the vaccine or if she contracted it at the same time as getting the vaccine and I'm a, another member of staff was on the antibody test research and had antibodies from previously contracting the virus she had the vaccine and said she felt as though she had covid again i think there are still a lot of unanswered questions uh, would one of our other panelists like to address this uh yep laura hi there laura Hi. Um, yeah, I've suddenly remembered that we didn't have the raise hand bit in this bit. Um, I think I just want to kind of take, um, I'm going to answer the question, but take just a little step back. Just to remember that um, the vaccine, whichever vaccine you have for COVID is a vaccine in a world where we use lots of vaccines. You know, so actually, um, you know, it's not that we never had vaccines before and all of a sudden we've now designed one vaccine. So things like life going on around a vaccine is normal. So if you're giving a vaccine to enough people, some people will have adverse reactions, very few. Some people will have side effects in the same way as if, if we all took a, a paracetamol. Some people will have a reaction and but most people will be OK. So I think we, we need to kind of think about it in kind of the in, in the real world as well. Be aware of the of the of the negative effects that can have. Be aware of also um, how um, a vaccine may affect somebody's bodies. People's bodies react differently. But also keep hold of the fact that actually, unfortunately, the other things that happen in life, people becoming ill, people dying, will happen as well anyway. And that everything that happens isn't just because they have the vaccine. Um, and I think that's where we need to kind of just put it in the real context. Even if we look at, you know, the data and the numbers that we're, that we're presented with in the news every day, you know, and that, that's fed to the public, it says for any cause within so many days of having a vaccine. So it's not that everybody who's died has all, have all necessarily died of COVID. It's quite hard to tell because normal life will occur. Normal life will occur in terms of how many, if you give the vaccine to very elderly, as we said, how many very elderly would have died in that period anyway? So I'm not saying minimize it, but I'm saying that just because something happens around the vaccine doesn't automatically mean it's because of the vaccine. Thank you. Um, Yokana asked, my colleagues who had the vaccine had never, had never had COVID before, but when they got it, they tested positive um, and they had to postpone their placements. 
Um, can you please allow staff and student nurses to have a choice on whether to have the vaccine or not? And Geraldine, I know that you touched on that. Otherwise, it feels like we are indirectly being for forced to have the vaccine, even if it's ev evident we have natural immunity to the virus. Geraldine, could I come back yeah, to you? On that so, one? Uh, so I think, you know, people aren't going to be forced to have the vaccine. And I'd, I'd go to one of our clinical experts on this, but I think it, it is possible to have the vaccine and then test positive. So you could still give it to someone else. So I think that the sort of same um, principles apply. You know, there are lots of good reasons to have the vaccine. Look at the evidence, look at the reliable evidence. If for some reason you can't have it, then um, don't feel that you are absolutely forced to have it. But actually there's, there's a lot of good reasons to have it. And, and I think some of these things, as Laura said, the things that, that sort of go together, or oh, I had the vaccine, then I was positive, you know, that might have happened anyway, um, and, and still probably could. So I think, you know, particularly in groups of students, I think it's really important to, to all try and keep centred and try and uh, discuss these things together, but seek out the right evidence uh, and, and seek the right advice. Thank you. Um, Winston, I think this is going to be another one for you. Um, what is the main difference between Pfizer and AstraZeneca? If these do not protect against the new variants, how many times would one need to be vaccinated and would, would this not reduce the efficacy and protection? All right. What's the difference between Pfizer and AstraZeneca? Um, well, they're both big pharmaceutical companies. Sorry, I'm joking. In terms of the vaccines, like, it's one's an mRNA virus, so that means it, you, it, it delivers um, the message by having the mRNA um, um, code that tells your cells to make the, the spike protein in a lipid um, capsule that, that's in the vaccine. The other one, the Astra one, it's a virus that's been, um, how can I put it? Um, castrated for want of a better word because it can't multiply. So all it can do is deliver the message and then effectively die. So in terms of um, vaccines, that's the difference between them. So one, one is sort of like made from lipids and one is made from a virus. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I did have another, I did have something else to say about um, a previous question, but it's gone off my head. If I remember, I'll come back to that. But we'll come, we'll ask me again, whoever asked that question and, and I might be able to answer it a bit better. We'll come back to you. Thank you. Um, do we know how long the vaccines can last? That's a $64 million question. It partly depends on, uh, for example, how rapidly the, the virus mutates. So you could, you might be immunized today, but then suddenly there's a new variant out that, and, and you, then you would need a, a, a new vaccine, depending on how different the, vi the variant was. So it, 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 who knows? Mm. You know, there's some vac there's some vaccines that last, as you you, you as health professionals will know, ten years, uh, and others. You know, like the flu, you have to keep getting them because the flu vaccine, the flu virus mutates so fast. So it all depends on mutation. That's a good reason why we all need to get the vaccine and get on top of this thing, so it doesn't keep hanging around and mutating and mutating. So, so, so if you if you don't want to get vaccinated again next year, have the vaccine now. As it were. Thank you. We've, I know we're, we're running short of time. We're due to start part two. I'll just try and get through another couple of questions. Um, what is the government doing to promote sense of integration and trust by BAME communities, BAME communities issue, in issues such as vaccination? What is the government doing to persuade BAME communities that taking the vaccine is not merely self-serving interest by the government to have herd immunity to protect the larger white, white population rather than for the interests of the BAME community? That's a big question. Felicia, you go first and then I'll, I'll, go, I'll come after. There, 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 is, there is loads being done. Um, I think what's very clear from so, so one of the first things to say is that around vaccine hesitancy, it's not just an ethnic community thing. There is hesitancy amongst lots of communities within the country. So that's the clear statement. Otherwise, you will demonize certain communities which isn't there's right. there's a bit of a problem with your microphone felicia i'm not sure there's so we're getting some <laughs> feedback we can hear you it's just there's a quite a bit of feedback on it okay i can hear you but it's, it's just a bit crackly yeah yeah oh, we, can't, we, we can't hear you now at all actually we'll come back we'll come back to you yeah sure marcus 
Yeah, I, I mean, Felicia was kind of going in the direction I was going to go, in, which is firstly, hesitancy is everyone's, there's lots of hesitancy, regardless of how you kind of break up the, the country by ethnicity, age, gender, whatever it may be. Um, uh, so the first thing we need to say is there's a, there's a massive, a massive, massive kind of comms and engagement campaign uh, being led by by the government to to tackle this hesitancy. However, to get at these, what I think the specific point is, uh, and it's linked to what I was saying earlier about how the the hesitancy kind of plays out differently in different communities. Um, I, I mean, I'm going to be frank. So there's been work going on for uh, different ethnicities and different faiths from the outset. Uh, I don't think any of the work was was wrong. But I mean, the, the proof is kind of in the pudding, you know, the hesitancy has remained uh, and less BME people have been vaccinated as a result. So what's happening now is there's a, an increased effort to do a range of things, but I'll touch on two because I think they're, they're probably the, the two most important for next steps. So I think the first thing is, um, I think there wasn't a good enough consideration of access to vaccination hubs at the outset. So for staff, we have the hospital hubs, it's fine. But for communities, where the vaccination hub is actually has a really massive impact on whether you're going to be uh, vaccinated uh, or not. You know, you might be hesitant, or you may not be, but if you can't get there, you won't be vaccinated. So there's, there's an effort, there's a big overlap between BME communities and more deprived communities, as we all know. And there's an effort now to kind of rectify that people being vaccinated in kind of pop-up uh, stations, people being vaccinated on buses. Uh, my grandmother was vaccinated in her home. So there's a lot more of an effort to kind of address those issues for, for BME people. The second bit is places of worship. Um, so, uh, and, and I don't just mean mosques, because I, often I think people assume it is mosques, but it's also gurdwaras, it's temples, it's black churches. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot more of an outreach now into those kind of uh, organizations. Because, like I said earlier, uh, for a lot of people, uh, your whatever you do professionally, it's your community that you're most you have most affinity to first. And for some people, it's their faith. Uh, and I think probably early on, uh, we probably underestimated uh, the importance of having uh, of giving people the opportunity not just to be vaccinated, but to discuss their concerns uh, in places that they felt most comfortable doing so. Thank you. Um, Felicia, we'll come to you. Can you hear me? Is it better now? M much better. Perfectly. Thank you. So I'm going to echo what Mark has said, but one of the key things I want to say is that it's not just down to the government. It's actually also down to us uh, as community people as well. Um, it's really important. And th there is, um, there is a, there's a big issue around trust um, with the government and trust with the whole process. And I, and I, and I do say that if the efforts that were made now around the vaccine were made in wave one when so much of the so many of the um, ethnic communities were impacted we probably have a very different conversation um, at this at this time so and we've lost and we've lost time because we probably should have been planning these engagement events well 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 before the vaccine came but we are we are where we are so there is humongous effort um, there's humongous effort by, by the government, by the communities themselves, and by uh, by the workers within the workforce themselves. So I think I think the crux of the matter is to make sure that we can give people as much information as possible. And there are so many quandaries for that. But also we need to understand people's fears. The people are much more well read now. They're intelligent. They are looking at various sources of um, of information. And there is a lack of trust. And I think what, if we can build up that tr trust within communities, then that will go a long way. And I think also people have to, the system has to acknowledge that um, we've had, you know, Visa has, has had a poor history in, ha in Africa with, his, with its uh, vaccine trials. Uh, sections of the Filipino community have had issues the Tuskegee drug trials in America. So that there are history that people are looking and are not forgetting, but I think it's around the trust issue and decreasing the myths. Thank you. Um, I think because, oh, sorry, Winston. No, I just want to say, um, we must really be careful when we, we start to talk about these particular events that are driving people, because we, in a sense, reinforce some of the misinformation um, about uh, what really happened. For example, the Kano thing is is not a vaccine. So if we're going to use these ever, these these points, we must really be careful. We don't, you know, sort of uh, attribute. We have to be accurate. 
Similarly, the Tuskegee thing, which I write quite a lot about also, was about denial of medical treatment rather than, um, if you like, you know, you know, so the, there was a medical treatment that they didn't give as opposed, whereas, you know, whereas at the moment the vaccine is available, but people aren't taking it. So those kind of nuances also cause confusion. So it's really important that when, when we talk about these things, we talk about them really, really accurately about what's happening. Otherwise that just adds to the confusion. I just thought I'd throw that, throw that in there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very conscious of time and that we, we're going over to part two, which will be held on Zoom Pro so that you can engage with our panel directly. Um, we will take all of these questions. Um, we can save them. We'll, I'll circulate them between the panel. And I've no doubt that they will inform future activity, knowledge and kind of just understanding of the issues. Um, Calvin, would you like me to run the last poll before you close? Yeah, do please. Perfect. There you go. So if you could all take just a couple of seconds to complete this poll. So after hearing from our panel today, what are your thoughts on the vaccine? I still plan to have the vaccine as previously stated. I've changed my mind and now plan to have the vaccine. I'm still hesitant about the vaccine. Or I'm still not convinced about the vaccine. Thank you. Lots of folks coming through quite quickly. Over half of you have voted so far. Keep them coming. So on the email that I sent earlier, you'll see the um, you'll see the link for the second part of this. Um, so once we finish this meeting, please do use that link to access part two. Um, that part will not be recorded, um, so that um, we can have um, frank, honest conversations. Um, thank you. We're almost there. If we just give it another half a minute for you to vote. Does anyone have anything they'd like to finish up on in from our panel? No, we'll save it for the next part. There you go. I'm going to call it there. So 10 more seconds. There you go. I'm going to share those results, Calvin. There you go. Over to you. Great. So great. So you know, the question was after hearing from our panelists today, um, what are your thoughts about the vaccine? So we have 56%, uh, no, 66%, sorry, um, saying I still plan to have the vaccine as previously stated. 13% um, says I have changed my mind and now plan to have the vaccine. 13% says I'm still hesitant about the vaccine. And 8% says I still am not convinced to have the vaccine. So uh, there we go. Um, thank you, Neil, for that. Uh, okay, so as Neil has said, you're in his previous, previously in his e last email to you, there's a link to join, go straight into the second section. So far, I just want to thank all the panelists for sharing their knowledge and information and their thoughts with us. Um, we really want to move into this frank discussion um, in the next session where we could actually take your questions, hear your voices, see your faces if you want to put in your camera on as well, because that facility is there and really hear from you as a student body or nurse educators where we are. I mean, this has really stemmed, as Felicia said earlier on, when the CNOBME Strategic Advisory Group initially in wave one, we had lots of conversations with qualified nurses and it's, we wanna really extend this to the student nurses so body. There may be more other webinars planned after this one, depending on how today goes and our feedback and planning, but we really wanna open this frank discussion and take it from there. So thank you all so far. Um, so we're going to end the session, but I'll pass you back to you to tell you exactly what to do again. So don't think we're closing off just yet. Neil, you're muted. It happens. It happens. Um, we will end this. We will end this session. Please use the link to sign into the next session on Zoom Pro, and we'll see you shortly. Thank you.